Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and Jai Hind. I, Lieutenant General Gautam Murthy, founder of CASA, on behalf of Team CASA, welcome you to the 28th CASA webinar and the first in the cybersecurity series. The overall objective of this webinar series, which has been spaced over four episodes of a fortnight apart, is to review the cyberspace strategies and capabilities of major world powers, compare these with the status in India and draw useful lessons. The series lays special focus on off offensive cyber and cyber influence operations. We welcome you today to episode one of the series, Conflicts in Cyberspace, Strategies and Structures of Major States. The objective of today's webinar is twofold to review the cyberspace capabilities of major players by studying their strategies and structures and drawing a comparison with India, and to brainstorm the merits and demerits of adopting an offensive defense stance in cyberspace and the need for developing offensive cyber capabilities accordingly. To share the views on this subject, we have with us a very distinguished panel with vast experience in the field of cybersecurity. Our first speaker of the evening is Dr. Nishikant Ojha, who is an expert in cyber terrorism and national security issue. He has in-depth expertise in the core area of national security strategies and reverse intelligence mechanism. He has worked for the government of India on many sensitive projects and policies in the core domain of national security and cross-boundaries terrorism. He has completed his postgraduate post-doctorate research in the area of IPv6 implementation, economic aspects of 4G implementation, artificial intelligence and FGN technologies from Aalborg University, Denmark. He is now responsible for taking care of overall issues of cyber attacks, cyber crime, cyber security, and cyber terrorism, including data flow and privacy issues. He possesses tremendous expertise in the general data protection regulation issues. He's also helped law enforcement agencies and supported paramilitary forces in counterinsurgency. He has also authored a book on cybersecurity. We welcome Dr. Oja and we look forward to his talk. The next speaker of the evening is Mr. Glenn Murray, who's joined us from Australia. He's an accomplished executive with extensive experience in leading multi-million dollar projects listed companies. His primary focus is in application of information communications, technology, and cybersecurity solutions across oil and gas, public utilities, mining, heavy vehicle manufacturing, defense, that is electronic warfare, and telecommunication industries. Glenn has also significant hands-on experience on design and architecting cybersecurity solutions. Over a number of years, Glenn has built an extensive global network of intelligence and cybersecurity professionals, including C-suite level. This combined with a passion for technology and cybersecurity innovative solutions allows himself to be up to date with the latest cyber threat landscape with associated cyber criminals, as well as with the competitive landscape within the industry. He has proven his history of hot leadership through presenting at industry events TED Talks, magazine publications, academic publications, news articles, and media interviews. Glenn's military background and focus on national security has built a passion for cybersecurity and protecting the world we live in. Glenn has embarked on studying for a PhD in cybersecurity at the Edith Cohen University in Perth, and when combined with a focus on strategic design, digital transformation, innovation, and organizational effectiveness, allows technology and di digitally enabled outcomes. Glenn also holds a master's in systems engineering and a bachelor's in electric engineering with first class honors. We welcome you Glenn to our webinar and look forward to you sharing your thoughts with us. Our third panelist is none other than Lieutenant General Dr. Rajesh Pant, PVSM, AVSM, VSM, retired who is an internationally recognized cybersecurity mentor and presently tenanting the prestigious appointment of National Cybersecurity Coordinator in the Prime Minister's office. In this capacity, he is responsible for coordinating all activities across multiple sectors to ensure a secure and resilient cyberspace within the nation. Under his stewardship, the nation has risen from 47 to the 10th position 
in Global Cybersecurity Index of 2020 by the United Nations, uh, not a mean feat. General Pant holds a PhD degree for his research in the field of information security metrics. He's also an MTech from IIT Kharagpur and MPhil from Madras University and a Master Management Studies from Osmana University, Hyderabad. Prior to this appointment, he was the head of Indian Army Cyber Training Establishment for three years. He served the Army Signal Corps for 41 years, wherein he was awarded three times by the President of India for distinguished service of the highest order. He has represented India at the World Economic Forum annual meeting on cybersecurity at the Prague 5G Security Conclave, Israel and Sing Singapore Cyber Weeks, and leads the network security and resilience vertical of global counter ransom way initiative. General Pan brings to the table an interesting mix at the intersection of national security, information operations, and global cyberspace governance. We welcome you, sir, to this webinar, and we all look forward to hearing your views on this hugely important subject. Our moderator for this webinar is Lieutenant General Dr. R.S. Panwar, AVSM, SM, VSM, who retired after 40 years of active military service in the Corps of Signals. His last appointment was Commandant of the Military College of Telecommunication Engineering, Mao, which carries out training of officers and soldiers in the field of ICT, electronic warfare, and cyber operations, and is also the designated center of excellence for the Army in these three disciplines. The general holds an MTech and PhD degrees in computer science and engineering from IIT Bombay, as well as a master of management studies from Osmania University, Hyderabad. He has attended the National Security and Strategic Studies course at the prestigious National Defense College, New Delhi, and is also a special one semester cryptology course at IIT Delhi. He's credited with implementing several enhancements to the Indian Army network, ushering in a network centric era in the highly active operational environment of JNK, as also for evolving organizational restructuring models as a part, as a part of the Army's transformation studies. The general is a recipient of several awards by the president for distinguished service in the defense forces and has also been awarded by the Department of Defense Production for R&D. Last year, he was conferred the coveted Distinguished Alumnus Award by IIT Bombay, the only defense officer to hold such an honor for his services rendered. Welcome, General Patnwar, and without further ado, it is over to you for the conduct of this webinar. Over to you, General Panwar. Thank you. Thank you, General Murthy, for that kind introduction. And it's a real honor to be here on this panel to moderate with such an eminent set of panelists uh, on the panel. And like you said, I'm sure this series of uh, webinars that we're having, four of them, uh, will prove very useful for our listeners and for policy making in general. Now, in order to set the stage for discussions, I shall begin by giving a brief overview of the increasingly potent and strategic effects being achieved through cyberspace by various players. The application of existing international law of war, specifically use at Bellum in cyberspace, and also touch upon global trends in cyberspace strategies and capabilities, uh, just an overview because the details will be taken on by the panelists. Now, cyberspace operations are being executed as part of the ongoing Russia-Ukraine conflict are being termed as the first global cyber war. The sheer magnitude of operations and the manner in which the opposing sides are aligned in cyberspace would have been unthinkable even a few years ago. Now, that stated, many expected Russia's cyber attacks to be more disruptive than have been witnessed so far. Of course, there have been several analysis for that. Now, at this point, I would like to highlight a few typical examples of uh, significant cyber attacks which have been conducted over the last decade or so. In 2010, everyone pretty knows Stuxnet, widely attributed to the US and Israel, destroyed 20% of Iran's nuclear centrifuges, the first strategic cyber attack which resulted in physical destruction. Then in 2015, the Russian attack on Ukraine's electrical grid disrupted electric supply to a quarter million citizens the first attack on an adversary state's critical infrastructure. Many believe that the hack and leak operations carried out by Russia in the 2016 US presidential elections were responsible for Hillary Clinton losing to Donald Trump, a good example of strategic cyber influence operations. 
The 2017 NotPetya malware attack attributed to Russia is estimated to have caused damages worth 10 billion US dollars globally and is considered to be the most disruptive cyber attack in history till date. The Russian attack on Viasat satellite network just in conjunction with the launch of the military operation on which the Ukrainian military de depends heavily for its communications impacted tens of thousands of customers in Ukraine and across Europe. This is an example of cyber attacks being carried out in conjunction with traditional military operations in land sea and air now seeing the increasing intensity of uh, effects impinging on national security being achieved through cyberspace the following questions arise firstly where does international law stand on the legality of offensive cyber operations employed by a nation state and secondly under what conditions and in what manner can a victim state respond to such attacks the legal justification for the employment of offensive operations against an adversary state including cyber operations is grounded in the notion of violation of sovereignty there appears to be international consensus that norms and principles that flow from sovereignty in physical space they also apply in cyber space a consensus which was arrived at by the un group of government experts or ungge on the use of cyber technologies way back in 2013 and 15 also accepted by the un general assembly in 15 and further consolidated upon by the un open ended working group as recently as last year however so far there is little clarity on the manner in which these norms and principles would apply Now, if one considers cyberspace to be a global commons, uh, just like international seas or space, implying thereby that there are no national cyber borders, how would violation of sovereignty in cyberspace take place? One possible way is to adopt an effects-based approach. As per this approach, for example, if a state A damages ICT infrastructure on the territory of state B, violation of sovereignty takes place. an alternative approach is to set up national level firewalls in order to establish actual borders in cyberspace this may be termed as the cyber sovereignty perspective now while this approach is derided by liberal democracies which advocate free flow of information given the increasing vulnerability of a state's critical infrastructure to cyber attacks perhaps the world might gradually veer towards adopting such mechanisms notwithstanding the resulting fragmentation of the internet now does violation of sovereignty per se amount to an illegal act as per international law in this regard there are three thresholds which are relevant well, in the physical space is also in decreasing order of severity as follows threshold of armed conflict principle of non intervention and mere violation of sovereignty each of which which legally justifies different levels of response now of course we are not going to details of this but how these thresholds manifest in cyberspace is a matter of intense debate in various international fora against the backdrop of the changing nature of cyberspace just brought out by me major global players have shown great agility by evolving national cyber strategies and organizations in order to defend their interests in cyberspace so i shall give a few highlights the us cyber command was raised in 2010 and the us department of defense published its first cyber strategy in 2011 and its latest in 2018 with two more revisions in between uh, in the same year as the us national cyber strategy that was national, uh, that was also in 2018 china raised its pla strategic support force in 2015 and its ministry for state security and certain other organizations are deeply involved in the conduct of information operations Russia's demonstrated capabilities for conducting information warfare are arguably the best in the world with cyber expertise spread across the SPR that's the foreign intelligence agency the GRU the military intelligence the FSB the internal intelligence as well as non state actors such as the internet research agency the UK published its national cyber security strategy in 2016 and has updated it this year established a national cyber security center under its gchq again an int organization in 2016 and the national cyber force as late as 2020 australia issued its national cyber security strategy in 
and establishes Defence Second and Cyber Command under the Australian Signals Directorate in 2018. Importantly, the strategies of all these five states declare the position of offensive cyber capabilities and the clear intention to use these for thwarting external threats. As regards India, the promulgation of its national cyber strategy is imminent. In terms of organizations, India established the CERT in way back in 2004, the National Critical Information Information Protection Center in 2014, the National Cyber Coordination Center in 2017, and the Defense Cyber Agency in 2019. Now with that, I shall request the panelists to provide greater insights into the strategies and organizations of major global powers on the one hand and India and the other, as uh, General Murthy had initially uh, briefed on, and give out recommendations on how India might improve its posture in cyberspace. We would also love to hear your views on the merits of adopting an offensive defense stand in cyberspace as opposed to a purely defensive one. With that, uh, I hand over the floor to Dr. Oja. Dr. Oja, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, sir, uh, Lieutenant General Panwar. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart to give me such an opportunity to express my views uh, on this particular and most important topic uh, which uh, CASA is bringing on this particular floor. Uh, interesting topic. Uh, and uh, just wanted to tell you that, uh, you know, the new age wars are no more fought by the guns, tanks, aircrafts, carriers, boats, or anything. It's all the information. It's basically the, all these types of warfare are basically essential parts of a governing system in most of the nation. It's not, we are not talking about Australia, India, it's all across the world. Every big developed nation is trying to be outsmart one another for economic and regional supremacy by introducing into the informational network of the prey nation. Now that's a very uh, important thing which I just wanted to tell you that uh, the most important thing which came in the era of cyber security or cyberspace, not only across to the Asian or GIC countries or the U European countries like where the GDPR, Mr. GDPR is there, it's basically the main problem is the, main, the electronic evidence which is not located in the territory of the instigating criminal justice authority. Data is increasingly stored, mirrored, fragmented, moving between servers somewhere in the cloud. We don't know. And we are still doing a kind of a tug of war. We are not clear what is to be done. We came across many cases where the Lazar's goods uh, attacked Indian soil through the cyber. Uh, mode. But when we went into the modus operandi of that, when we did a dissection, it was perpetrated basically from the soil of uh, China. So it's not that uh, China has to come directly and hit you. He can populate, he can use the different soil from the different countries because it's all in the, in the basically somewhere in the cloud. It's basically the multiple or unknown jur jurisdiction where criminal and justice authorities are normally limited by the principle. Even if the data of is stored in the territory of investigation authority and a server or device could be lawfully searched and seized, this will not be sufficient. So a lot of things are there. Now the question therefore is how electronics evidence can be secured lawfully and effectively for criminal justice purpose. So to address this question, like European countries join hand together and they form Mr. GDPR. So they can easily exchange the biometric data. They can exchange all kinds of our data from one country to the another. And that suffice, that had really worked in a remarkable way. But what about, see, I told you, it's a war of uh, information. The more the country has the information, the more stronger he is in the economical, political, military, all kinds of things. So now it's something, it's a kind of a geopolitical issues also, which is there, which basically creates some kind of a problem. Let's take you know, an example to address this question in December 2014, the Cyber Convention Committee, TCOI, uh, representing the parties to the Council of Europe uh, Budapest Convention was established. Cloud evidence working, CG was formed in 2016. But India didn't came. India was, is not a member of the Budapest Convention and it's not a part of the 66 countries who are basically ratified there. So in between that, Russia, 
India and this were left isolated. Might be Russia could have some kind, certain kind of when uh, see it's it's a, something. It's a kind of a war. It's a kind of an art. You never know what is going inside that. So if we get an access to the other uh, other country and the data are exchanged, might be there would be a lot of repercussion in due course of time. So in that. GDPR came and they told, okay, we are not concerned about that. Let us unite together. In fact, in that UK moved away from that. And he said, no, my GDPR will be my different one. So there are around 99, 99 articles which are levied in the GDPR. Now, basically, what kind of data which we found? I interacted in many cases, uh, like the agencies in the Interpol, they came up with certain kind of a problem. They said that we cannot cash the culprit because of the lack of the data. Now, what kind of data which they are, it's basically the subscriber information indicating the users of a service, such as a webmail, and which is with the IP, the most important thing, and the traffic data and the content data. In that particular, the UN cybercrime treaty process, uh, Russia was been promoting a lot of global cybercrime treaty for at least a decade. Buddha based convention, many countries came, but nothing is tangible or is there. Now, what is the problem is that now everybody is securing themselves. They are not worried about uh, the other part of the nation or other part of the world which are there. Now, there is nothing like for the GIC countries. There is nothing for the Asian countries. There is nothing for the Middle East or any kind of countries. Only thing is that which we have seen is that basically the GDPR and obviously the Australia is one of the member of that. I think the GDPR is there. So we don't have a sign kind of an ecosystem which basically gives a kind of a robust environment where we can intercept when we can have a kind of a real time data from different countries. So now when we are talking about the 2019 new global cyber crime treaty came separate international. As of me, what I have seen is that because ITU is also working hard enough, but it cannot be, he cannot do anything when there is a synergization, where there's an integration of the different countries together. Now, if I want some kind of a data from the cloud, from US, I, can, I, mean, I cannot get that, those data. I cannot get the traces because that attack is being masked. You never know because where the attacks had been done. Today, technology, especially the internet, is in situ our daily life. We, we use it control. And now Mr. IoT has came. It has made hell of the life. It makes the things have moved in a different level. Now, when we talk about the Asian cyber threat assessment, basically under that mandate of reducing the global impact of cyber crime, protecting communities for a safer world, Interpol cyber directories, core activities to collect, store, process, analysis. But Interpol is not getting those data. Where will the Interpol, if the data are not given or they are not fetched by the Interpol, he cannot do, he cannot justify, he cannot let the other country become like uh, to safeguard the data data from the updated countries. Now, basically, when, we, when the data was drawn from the Interpol member countries, we see that maximum there was the attacks like the business email compromise was there. Phishing is there, ransomware is there, crime as a service was there, cyber scam, uh, crypto, and many things were there. Inside, uh, basically, what we require is that to know, to produce a kind of a robust system within our country and within the friendly countries is basically the intelligence gathering, unauthorized access to the mail accounts of a company, leveraging information obtained from emails to launch school, and then document forgery. A lot of things are there. And then basically the Asian joint operation on the cyber crime, they united uh, hand together and they came and say, okay, we will collect and analyze, then we'll prioritize, evaluate. And then basically a lot of things, but in reality, nothing is happening as of now because it's lack of integration and it's, it's a general principle. It's something that why I should pass my information to somebody else, because right my that information which I will pass to you would be used not today, but in due course of time in some other way to interest. So India is not a member of still the 66 countries rectified. And basically the uh, another thing is that the second additional protocol with convention on the cyber crime and disclosure of the electronic evidence, he's also not a part of the DAG. And basically, 
uh, what we can say is that we need, we cannot uh, keep on waiting for the, that somewhere we will get an opportunity and we will join and together already India has, uh, sir is there, let me tell you, Rajesh Pant is there, he knows that we already have an MOU, we already have an arrangement with the around 18 countries where the synchronization needs to be done and we can pull and push the data as and when required on a real time basis because see it's it's everything is masked you cannot decode you cannot intercept what is going in the dark and deep web millions of trillions of data are sold just like that so we need we are in need of the multilateral treaties which can take which will take years to negotiate and even longer to come into force and there is no guarantee that two thirds of government will be reached and an agreement for a treaty to be adopted. Instead of pursuing a global treaty, there are numbers of measures which the government should take. Not now. No, we are not talking about the Republic of India. It's all the other countries which are basically suffering from these kind of things. You need to come and address the cyber crime, and then you should have a kind of a use mutual legal assist treaties, and then agreement to ensure a high level of protection for right. We helped, I helped a country and uh, I, I just want to put it into the forum that the UA was the country where they were searching for certain kind of imposters, which was far away. He moved away somewhere and they were not able to track Chris because their last location was that person was showing in the Abu Dhabi and after that they were not there. Case FIR lost in the Interpol, Interpol was searching for two third, around three years, not able to look at whether he is alive, dead or where, whether he's moving in the African countries. Because of the lack of the information, they are keep on writing the information to the MI6, MI5, SIS in the UK, but nothing came. So basically, these are some of the obstacles, the challenges which we are in uh, facing. As of now, as of my understanding, which I have uh, understood is that instead of basically uh, waiting for these things, we should also have a kind of our, our own mechanism, like just like a GDPR. GDPR is there, but let us uh, kind of uh, GIC countries, South Asian countries, Asian countries, we should synergize together and we should integrate and join hand together for sharing of the data on a real time. Only then the things will work. When we are talking about the ITU, ITU can only advise ITU. If you bring on the table of ITU, he can only tell. ITU says that if you bring and tell me that, okay, this attack was done from the A country, but you're, uh, I mean, you were able to witness that attack from the B country. You need to prove and because the B country is in a position to negotiate, but A country, the laws and everything do not. So it's a kind of a, <laughs> we always should say so the, when processing requests for the cross border access to the data it's uh, it's jesus christ it's it's something which is impossible so we need to have a mechanism like russia is doing russia already is in touch with iran and they are formulating a kind of a consortium which basically will uh, work similar like that and they are not uh, waiting for somebody from the european countries or anything to join hand together Similar like for the Asian and South Asia, we also need to have a kind of integration of these countries. Once this integration is done, then these integration, A integration, B integration, C integration, sooner or later, they will be, it's interdependent. Nobody can live in isolation. So whether- Sorry, Dr. Hoja, do you want to wrap up in a minute, please? Thanks. So basically, uh, my submission is that we basically, should be in a position to have a transparency and the right protection law enforcement request for the data for the investigation. And as well as a technical assistant to the countries struggling with cyber crime could only the way where we can move forward. Thank you so much, sir. I will not take much of your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Oja, for that impassioned plea for uh, having some mechanisms in place. Uh, for sharing of data, which is a very important thing for tackling cybercrime. In fact, it's equally important for tackling state-on-state -state cyber conflicts as well, as it relates to international law, which we would like to focus on during these four webinars. Thank you so much. Uh, now I hand over the floor to Mr. Glenn Murray to give a perspective from Australia. Uh, and of course, any other comments that you might have. Over to you, Mr. Murray.
Thank you, sir. No, that's uh, again. I'd like to highlight my, uh, you know, uh, very humbled to be a part of such an esteemed uh, panel. Um, I've spoken at many events um, across uh, across the world, and uh, you know, the same topics come up over time and time again. And you know, my, you'll see my passion come out as I speak about this is because we do a lot of talking, and in these corporate environments, what I'm not seeing is the action that we need to gain together. And just to to echo. Um, the the importance of data sharing but it's not just the data sharing it's the threat intelligence that we need and i'll explain why as i go through that so i just want to get a couple of terms in in, in place first so we're on the same page so i'm just going to talk from a defense context uh, very quickly that the cyber domain now is now considered the fifth domain in warfare and so we have our traditional you know air land uh, sea space and now we have our cyber domain now, the cyber domain can be on its own merits a domain that, that, that modern warfare is fought. However, it is the enabler now to make other domains more efficient. And so that's, that's really pushing forward now as we see, you know, especially between the, uh, the Russian-Ukraine war, you know, and I don't know how many people on this call are aware, but the amount of cyber attacks that are happening um, within that, uh, you know, that environment that's coming out. The sad reality of that is that when you design a cyber attack, you don't normally say, I want it to hit a person, and that's it. It goes out to the cyberspace, and that goes to everybody that is accessing that cyberspace. And before long, like the one prior attack that we all uh, fell victim to uh, some years ago now, it spreads throughout the, out the world. And it's no you know, you know, um, you know, it, uh, accident that a cyber attack Initially, it's called a virus because that's how it spreads throughout the world. In that same thought process, there is no geographical boundaries here. If you see a cyber attack happening, you know, it's happening from anywhere in the world. And as I tell everyone that uh, you know, I speak to, is attribution is one of these aspects that we must be comfortable with, is that we can't we can't, without you know, um, uh, them other measures, understand where a cyber attack is coming from. You know, everyone's uh, familiar with you know terminology like VPNs and so forth, where I can hide and mask my IP and look like I'm attacking from anywhere in the world. That is a, that is what the cyber criminals are doing at the moment. Within the, the Australian Defence Force, you know, um, I, I know unclassified, there is over a thousand networks. With, with some more, you know, 320,000 endpoints and devices. That is all the ways of an attack that are coming in through uh, the outside coming in. But what is becoming more and more um, the, the forefront now is the critical infrastructure of the countries. The critical infrastructure is where the cyber criminal now is finding that soft underbelly into able to do their attacks. And it's not just that critical infrastructure entity itself, it may be the supply chain of that critical infrastructure. And so through that, um, that is becoming the, the point of attack that you'll find that cyber criminals are using to move forward. Now to, to emphasize uh, the IoT, what's, you know, the internet of things and the, the industrial internet of things that these critical infrastructure uh, entities hold, there is some 50 billion connected devices around the world. There is 350,000 new malware registered each day. There is, a, there is a shortage, a global shortage of cybersecurity professionals of some 4 million professionals. There is $20 million in ransomware that was recorded in 2021 alone. There's about 6 billion people on the planet and it's costing the world $6 trillion each year. These are all big numbers. The point being that this is a big problem. This is not a country on its own problem. This is a global problem that we should be looking at and moving forward with. And so what did Australia do? Well, they, they started down this path of what they call the Security Legislation Amendment, Critical Infrastructure Protection. And they started to change what is known as critical infrastructure to start to look at those supply chains, that soft underbelly, that where the cyber criminal or cyber warfare is starting to come through. The art of warfare is timeless. 
the way to defeat a military has always been, you know, taking out supply chains. So there's no difference now if I had a military base. If I want to disable that military base, what do I do? Well, the first thing I'm going to look at is how do I take out the electricity supply? How do I take out the water treatment plant? How do I take out the hospital that's supplying those critical services to that military base? I'm not looking at taking out the actual entity itself. And so from that, now it feeds why the Critical Infrastructure Act within Australia now has expanded from your traditional energy, water treatment and ports to now include entities like water and sewage, healthcare and medical, space technologies, data storage and processing, energy, defense industries, communications, transport, food and grocery, financial services, and last but not least, higher education and research. They are all now considered to be critical infrastructure and in where the cybersecurity elements have been heightened. The legislation now describes what is considered to be the critical infrastructure un under those verticals and what those entities must be able to do to be able to respond, detect to a cyber attack. And so there's no you know, accident that these entities form what we were starting to understand as being the smart city, which smart defense forms a part of that. And so these IoT devices and these, what we've known in these uh, critical infrastructure entities known as SCADA devices, have no cybersecurity inbuilt in their capability. Yeah? So let's just rethink about that. We don't have any cybersecurity by design in these devices that are being deployed in our critical infrastructure, which is forming the underbelly to our defense forces. These devices have been designed for data loss to make sure that when you press that red button, that conveyor belt stops in case the electro electronic brake has, has, has um, engaged and it's un some, under someone's hand. Press the button and it stops. That's what it's designed for. They were never designed for cybersecurity. And so what you find now is this convergence between the IT enterprise and the OT, the operational technology. And this operational technology is what is referred to in the critical infrastructure environment. And so within, within the cyberspace or in, in uh, the cybersecurity uh, profession or, or academic world, it's always been known that there's been this triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, which are the main things that you're, you're really making sure are part of the information and technology domain. And so, for example, in an IT world, you know, your confidentiality of your data comes first. Yeah, so you've got to log onto your computer. You've got to put your password in. The integrity of your data to make sure that it isn't compromised to come second. And lastly, what comes last is the availability of your data. And it's not uncommon for you to go into your office and you'll see a message on your screen to say the IT uh, completing a patch update because that's considered to be last. In the OT domain, it swaps around. The availability of data is upmost the first priority. Again, when you press that red button to make something stop, it happens. Whereas the password control of anything is nearly non-existent in a lot of organizations. The understanding of being able to, you know, just a general awareness of, of hey, there's a USB device on the ground, can I go and plug it into a, into a machine? He's available. And so that's the change that we need to start thinking about. And so the other thing that I'd like this group to understand is, is what are the motivations of a cyber criminal? And so you have your, the ones that will, will, will probably you know, um, understand uh, espionage, so seeking access to sensitive information, activism, where you have that, that, that seeking that, uh, that, that public facing or creating dis disruption to achieve another object objective. Obviously the criminal 
you know, from a financial gain, a criminal damage, theft, um, you know, that type of area. The terrorism that we briefly spoke about in the last speaker, you know, causing that physical and economic disruption. But now we're also bringing into that, that warfare. So disabling port facilities, for example, disruption of transport, denying operational use. Imagine if you could cut off the fuel supply of a defence force. Quite, quite crippling very quickly. What we're seeing now is in the age we're moving forward to is everything's as a service. You know, we, we, we started with software as a service and we had infrastructure as a service. Now we have ransomware as a service. We have entities out there, one of them that you can look up on in Google, for example, called RE Evil, R E E V I L. They offer, they set it up as a business. They offer 24 7 support, subscription based, online forum support. They've claimed that make in, in a financial year $100 million US. They're a business. You can hire this company to be able to design a malware or a ransomware to apply to a critical infrastructure and then get paid for it. This is what we're up against. And this is where I said at the start of this, when I started talking, I implore that we need to start to understand that there's no geographical boundaries here. I see a lot of talk and we, and we discuss this a lot in these forums, but the time is now to start acting. I will just finish on a sad note that we've seen last year, our first death that directly attributed to a cyber attack. It was of a baby in a hospital. The doctor was going through a delivery in that delivery suite, this, the ransomware attack had taken out some critical devices. In what would be a normal straightforward delivery was now interrupted. And sadly, the baby didn't make it. The flow on effect though, is it's the hospitals that pay because these are the ones now where the parents start suing in order to get their, you know, some kind of closure. And so that's the world we're moving into now. And so this is why we need to and emphasize the last speaker's comment. We need to start sharing the data, but we need to be able to have this threat intelligence in a more global aspect. What does a cyber criminal want? If I was a cyber criminal, I would make sure that if I attacked one country, that the next country didn't know that happened or how it happened. They don't want them to share the data. They don't want them to understand how it worked because if they did develop a zero day attack, they want that to be a zero day attack on country one and country two and country three. So we've got to work the other way. We've got to start sharing our threat intelligence in a global aspect to be able to stop the cyber criminal now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Murray, for that excellent exposition of um, the whole spectrum of issues related with essentially protection of critical infrastructure, but the way in which you related it to warfare. In fact, uh, I would like to highlight some of the major points uh, that you brought out that it's not just data sharing, uh, it's the threat intelligence, uh, which is very important from being able to tackle this entire problem of uh, when we are looking at from a warfare point of view. You brought out the importance of attributions, a very important thing we feel Everybody knows that attribution in cyberspace is a very difficult problem, but it's not that it cannot be done. And uh, collaboration amongst countries is very important for, and this threat intelligence is all very important aspects of leading on to attribution. In fact, uh, it was stated at the outset in the seminar as to how Russia and uh, US and all have you know, traded uh, charges as to who's done what. So this is all backed up by certain amount of evidences which have been uh, gathered through the mechanism of attribution which itself is a uh, process by itself. The, 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 the point that critical infrastructure and its protection and the various aspects of it are so huge, it's a very uh, huge problem which has to be tackled. Uh, it's very important to note that uh, Australia has been one of the first countries to expand the definition of critical infrastructure, including to food and beverages, etc. Because it is once it is brought under the 
rubric of uh, and the ambit of critical infrastructure, there are certain legal aspects also come into play. And uh, scatter systems, how they are unpredicted, the way they were designed, and now security has to be built into it, uh, is the key aspect of the underbelly, underbelly of the armed forces, as you say. This is the place where the attackers would are going to uh, find the vulnerabilities and attack if they want to attack a military force. I'll stop here for the time being. There are a large number of other issues which you had brought up. With that, I will move on to the last speaker of the day, which is uh, General Pant, the National Cyber Security Coordinator for India. And uh, we hope to hear a very uh, insightful perspective as far as India and the world is concerned. Over to you, General Pant. Thank you, uh, Rajan, and uh, it's always good to be the last speaker. Most of the issues have already been sorted out. But uh, greetings of the day to uh, uh, my fellow panelists and all the 56 participants that I see here in this uh, seminar, plus all the YouTubers. Uh, thanks to General Gautam Murthy for having me here. And I uh, must compliment uh, this think tank on uh, current and uh, strategic affairs termed as CASA for organizing this uh, series of webinars uh, centered around cyberspace. Uh, today's episode is uh, focused on uh, uh, conflicts in cyberspace, strategies and structures of major states. And this is the area I would like to focus on because the other three episodes are going to cover uh, the other aspects of uh, you know, offensive, et cetera. Uh, uh, let me also compliment General Panwar for moderating this session extremely well so far with his introductory talk and all my previous uh, speakers also. Uh, you see, the strategies and structures are probably the most important aspect for ensuring a safe and secure cyberspace. Because this is the fountainhead. What is your governance structure? What is your strategy? Everything else flows from there. And let me also share with you, uh, in the beginning, uh, General Gautam mentioned about how we have come up from 47th position to the 10th position. The first question out of the 157 questions that you have to answer there is, does the nation have a national cybersecurity strategy? That is the first question, which shows how important a national strategy is for the governance of cyberspace. Uh, we are also seeing presently a shift from uh, cybersecurity towards cyber power. If you see some of the new strategies uh, especially the one that you mentioned of the UK coming out. Uh, there is now uh, a new index also of cyber power, plus in the strategy itself, there is a shift towards creating cyber power. Uh, let me first make a few generic points on uh, the governance aspects and why uh, different nations have different structures. The starting point is the type of government uh, that is there in that particular nation. So if it's an autocracy uh, like China, uh, there is a very tight control over the entire governance structure. So directly under President Xi Jinping, we have today a cyberspace administration of China. And under the cyberspace administration of China, we have the strategic support force under which the earlier third and fourth department have become the network systems department and the space systems department. And uh, cyber ops is under the network systems department. So it's a very clear structure. A lot of things can be done in an autocracy, as you're aware, and I don't want to go into the details. Uh, if you see countries like the USA and the UK, uh, they are very closely linked with the private sector. Uh, in fact, in UK, uh, I found a very good ecosystem that uh, a person, let's say, who's serving in the National Cybersecurity Center, he can go from there to the private sector. He can continue doing his cybersecurity job. Then he can go to some academic institution. He can go to some industry. So. Uh, there's a very nice ecosystem for cybersecurity professionals to move around. Uh, in the US, you are aware that uh, even their uh, uh, financial uh, plan that comes out, the budget, uh, the draft is made by Booz Allen Hamilton, the consultancy firm, and then the government tweaks it and uh, the government uh, issues out the statement. So this is another aspect that affects the cybersecurity governance and the cybersecurity structure as to how does the government function or in the constitution of that nation, the government functions. Another aspect is how quickly are organizations created in a nation uh, and strategies 
are created. For example, in the US, the Colonial Pipeline attack took place on the 5th of May, 2021. And on 12th of May, they came out with an executive order of the president stating that how the cybersecurity of the nation will henceforth uh, be uh, carried out and it included a lot of you know, mandatory guidelines for the private sector, et cetera. <clears throat> uh, the way the Indian government functions is in a different manner. Uh, we are in a sense, if I may say, very restrictive uh, within the ministries that are existing. Uh, although some changes have now taken place, there's a lot of lateral induction has started. Experts have now started coming into the post of joint secretary in the government of India. So things are changing now. But these generic aspects are what decides on how uh, the cybersecurity governance and strategy of the government will be. So as far as the Indian setup at present is concerned, uh, we were one of the first with our IT Act. In the year 2000, there were hardly any nations which had come out with the IT Act. So the IT Act 2000, its 2008 amendment, and even our cybersecurity policy of 2013, in which the work had actually started in 2011, were actually the vanguards in cybersecurity. But it is the 2013 policy which is officially uh, invoked today. And that created the framework for the organizations that are existing at the moment. So my office, in fact, came out of the uh, 2013 policy, National Cybersecurity Coordinator's Office, the uh, uh, I4C for the crime, the National uh, Indian Cyber Crime Coordination Center came out of that. Uh, the National Cyber Coordination Center for Predictive Analysis came out of that, uh, as well as uh, various other uh, aspects, which I shall explain after a certain time. So uh, let me just explain to you how we are organized uh, at the national level. I would like to classify our organizations, uh, which are external facing, and the organizations which are internal facing, and some organizations which are both. Now, by and large, I have found in the strategies and the governance structures of all the other major nations also, that the Ministry of Defense has been kept separately. It is there, the Cyber Command in the US and Australia also, and MOD in UK also, which is why you have the cyber, uh, National Cyber Force. So on one side, you have the National Cyber Security Center. On the other side, you have the Ministry of Defense. And on top of them, you have the National Cyber Force in the, in the UK example. Similarly, in India, a uh, few years back, as uh, General Rajan mentioned, we created our Defense Cyber Agency. And uh, in addition to that, in every service, Army, Navy, Air Force, we have the service cyber groups. Uh, in addition, under the DRDO also, we have some organizations which are handling uh, cyber security. So these organizations are both internal facing as well as external facing. So let's leave the Ministry of Defense out at the moment. Uh, the other external facing organizations are uh, firstly our uh, NTRO, National Technical Research Organizations. Then we have the Ministry of External Affairs and the uh, Research and Analysis Wing. The internal facing organizations are many. Uh, starting from cybercrime within the MHA, we have, as I mentioned, the I4C as well as the Intelligence Bureau. Uh, within METI, we have uh, the uh, CERTIN. CERTIN is probably the most important organization uh, uh, as far as incident response is concerned. Uh, then we have the National Cyber Coordination Center. Uh, and of course, we have the STQC, the Standardization Testing and Quality Certification Directorate, which is does the software testing, et cetera, and gives the national assurance framework. Then in various ministries, we have uh, uh, what is called as the CSIRT, Cyber Security Incident Response Team, or the Security Operations Center. So uh, within the DOT, we have a telecom, a TSOC, we call it Telecom Security Operations Center. Within the Ministry of Power, we have the Power Cert. Within the Ministry of Finance, we have created a FinCert, etc. And there are these sectoral certs uh, in various ministries. And then the states are very important. In India, the states, uh, as of today, the IT department of the states is handling the cyber, and they have their own statewide area networks and the state data centers, etc. So they have their own cyber uh, organizations, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm telling you they're doing a good job, uh, some of the states at least. Uh, for the critical uh, information infrastructure, and the moderator mentioned that, uh, we created the National uh, Critical Information Infrastructure Protection Center. It, it is a very large organization with a very important role uh, uh, for the critical infrastructure. Now, uh, Glenn also mentioned about the critical infrastructure as to how the Australian government has raised it from four earlier to 11 now. 
but the debate these days is is anything not critical is education not critical you know water supply he mentioned is uh, critical so presently in india we have officially six uh, sectors that we have uh, said are critical and a seventh one health is being added but the point is after the pandemic and the digital transformation that has taken place and our dependence on the uh, digital infrastructure has increased so much that everything today is critical um, as far as the law part is concerned the moderator wanted to know about the legal aspects also uh, being a non aligned nation uh, india basically focuses on strategic partnership and uh, dr oja also mentioned about regional aspects uh, let me assure everyone we have a very very vibrant uh, cooperation at the counter ransomware initiative uh, which is a group of 36 nations uh, where i am leading the vertical on uh, network security and resilience uh, within the quad uh, quad is now not only focused on the south china sea or something after our leaders met in march last year there are nine verticals uh, including your vaccine climate etc and within the quad there is a quad senior cyber group uh, where i lead and uh, intense discussions take place within the quad and whether it is bimstack the shanghai cooperation organization asean brics colombo security everywhere uh, we are there and there is a lot of cyber cooperation taking place at the regional level uh, india of course uh, has always uh, uh, promoted uh, multi stakeholderism and uh, un led uh, bodies uh, which is why so far we are not the uh, member of the budapest convention and in the united nations recently there is a committee which has been created for uh, creating a convention on ict based uh, cyber crime Three meetings of this uh, committee have already been held, and we hope that some convention is created at the earliest. I was an observer in the last UNGG, uh, which the moderator also mentioned. Uh, but uh, uh, personally, I feel that the eleven voluntary non-binding norms on responsible behavior by states uh, in cyberspace is giving too much laxity. Uh, for example, uh, one of the norms is that no state will allow its territory. to be used to attack the critical infrastructure of another state i hope uh, uh, this is followed in the letter and spirit because presently uh, what dr oja was also mentioning the way the three four hops attacks come it, it is very very difficult so uh, we are presently focusing on how to implement these norms at least within the asean i have found they, they have got together as to how to implement these norms um, and some very interesting discussions take place uh, Uh, for example i remember uh, there was a discussion on the international humanitarian law applicable in uh, cyber space and uh, one of the nations i think russia uh, someone said that uh, uh, cyber operations take place in peace time also whereas uh, the international humanitarian law is only applicable in war so uh, within the united nations uh, let me share with you every word is contested even when these 11 non binding norms were being uh, created when someone mentioned trusted supply chain there was a huge furor as to what do you mean by trusted supply chain and no it required a lot of black black chain talks etc so uh, coming back to the strategy aspect uh, uh, before that uh, i think the moderator also wanted to know our views on the offensive part now uh, we uh, are clear that you cannot defend unless you know what you are what is coming at you so uh, the entire mitra attack framework uh, which people are aware of uh, the stages of an attack has to be uh, understood uh, you have to have a concept of an assured defense posture if you really want to defend yourself in uh, cyber space as uh, glenn was also mentioning because today there are multi domain operations and uh, a lot of coordination is required uh, so that uh, you don't have uh, uh, one blue attacks etc um uh, so let me just uh, come back to the cyber governance part that's to whatever structure a uh, government uh, tries to create it has to cater for certain mandatory things in cyber space what are those mandatory things first is education and awareness at a national level education and awareness creating cyber hygiene starts from the children adults and the businesses uh, uh, government etc it's a huge program it's a huge project education and for awareness is a very important aspect why should we wait for a cyber attack to take place we have to take a number of actions to ensure that attacks do not take place second thing is capacity building of the workforce the cyber skilled workforce that that also has to be taken into account 
then is the predictive analysis. All these actions I'm saying is before the attack takes place. Predictive analysis is that NCCC that I mentioned that how can we monitor the gateways from the metadata and then try and predict if there's a DDoS attack taking place in a particular port, et cetera. Uh, then the sharing of threat intelligence uh, also, which uh, was mentioned, the audit and risk assessment. This is again a very, very important aspect as to uh, how do we calculate and advise on the risk, especially to the critical sector, and how do we conduct the minimum baseline audits? Because when you're paying for the audits, I find the industry only the minimum ticks were being done. So now we've issued directions. You can go to a certain portal and see that the minimum baseline uh, uh, requirement which has been given for the audits. Critical infrastructure, I've already uh, spoken of. Uh, then uh, the states, uh, cyber is to be involved. Then we come to the incident response. Now, now the incident has taken place. So the, uh, the framework that you create has to cater for the incident response, the remediation, and the recovery. This is very important. How do, how do you do it centrally if there's a cert in there? How does it interact if something has happened in the south or northeast of India? Then, of course, the issue of advisories, alert, or TLP protocol, etc. And after the incident, the forensics. So the organization has to cater for the forensics part. Then for cybercrime, there's a totally different uh, requirement, uh, especially financial frauds, interacting with the banks, ensuring that the money is stopped before they get away with it, trying to trace cryptocurrency, etc. It's a totally different department. Then we come to cyber diplomacy. This we have not discussed. Cyber diplomacy is also part of your framework as to how do you conduct the international cooperation uh, through the Ministry of External Affairs. And then there's this aspect of cyber law. Uh, the Cyber Security Act is there in some countries. The new age crimes that are being mentioned against ransomware and cryptocurrency, there is a new requirement of a Cyber Security Act. The public-private partnership also has to be a part of your framework. And finally, which we have the, uh, the HR aspects. Uh, what has the government of India done? The, uh, the new cybersecurity strategy that is being mentioned. Um, I was the chairman of the task force. We took about two years and we have uh, submitted the cabinet note uh, to the cabinet committee of security for approval. Uh, that caters for the entire whole of nation approach. And we have this concept of CBDR, the common but differentiated responsibility where everyone, individuals, business, academia, government responsibilities are given. The aspects of uh, education, awareness, large number of deliverables are there as part of uh, the strategy. In addition, we have taken on some sectors uh, straight away, like telecom sector, we issued the National Security Directive on the telecom sector to cater for the supply chain risk. In the power sector, we recently issued guidelines for all the verticals of generation, transmission, distribution, and grid operations. The Central Electricity Authority, which is the regulator, has a <clears throat> trained these CISOs and uh, uh, ensured that uh, all the 600 utilities are today equipped for both the IT and the OT aspects uh, that uh, Glenn was mentioning. Uh, finance, we created the PINCERT, a number of guidelines by RBI has been issued. Uh, the recent directions of 28th April by CERT, they cater for your uh, time synchronization, reporting of incidents within six hours, keeping logs uh, uh, for 180 days. Uh, VPS, VPN so, uh, so, uh, providers have been told to ensure that they keep five-year data, etc. And a large number of guidelines have been issued uh, for government employees. So in a nutshell, uh, this, is, this is what I thought I will cover as to how the international uh, you know, governance structures take place, how they are dependent on their own uh, constitutional rights and the way the governments function, and uh, what all are the components of a strategy and where we stand at the moment uh, within the nation. Uh, with that, thank you very much, Jai. Thank you so much, Jai Pant, for that excellent exposition and wide spectrum of uh, aspects that you covered. I'll just highlight uh, just a few of them, which I found most striking. Firstly, the importance of strategy, which you uh, brought out at uh, the initial point itself. Uh, and that we were one of the first uh, in India to come up with something. But of course, we are eagerly waiting for this new strategy which is pending for some time to come out. Uh, the distinction between moving from a cyber security power to, a, to a cyber security to cyber power, this change in paradigm, I think is extremely important. And uh, what are those elements?
which would change in gauging that you are a cyber power as against uh, strong in cyber security uh, needs to be analyzed. Uh, your correlation uh, between the type of government and the quickness of action and the type of actions that you can take to secure cyberspace is an equally important point. The relevance of the strategic support force, etc., and of course the presidential form of government which you mentioned are all very relevant. Uh, the uh, the exposition, uh, detailed exposition of what our governance structure looks like today uh, has been covered. I'll, of course, not go over the details. Uh, an important point uh, which General Bunt made was uh, when Australia has increased its list of critical infrastructure, the question comes up is what is not critical? But I think there may be a relevant point there because like uh, uh, General Bunt himself said, one of the norms is uh, states will not attack critical infrastructure of another state. So if it comes under the ambit of critical infrastructure, it's probably protected by that norm. However, General Pant also brought out that uh, the enforcement of norms is what is very important. So if you don't have a means of enforcement of norms, the whole thing is quite meaningless. It was very heartening to note uh, that we have collaboration, strong collaborations, uh, something which uh, Dr. Ojao was referring to collaborations on all these platforms like BOD and BIPSTEC and BRICS, etc., etc. And we are moving forward uh, in line with a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, so this is uh, 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 this is an aspect uh, which he covered very, uh, very succinct, succinct, succinctly. And of course, the mechanism of the response which we're going for uh, has been uh, articulated uh, for our viewers. So uh, these are just some of the highlights. I think it was an excellent exposition of the entire spectrum of activities to do with uh, what we are looking for in this episode. So with that, we come to uh, an end of what the speakers have to say. And I can see four questions here uh, in the Q&A. So let me cover them one by one. The first question is addressed to Janal Pant. And it says by Brigadier Sanjay Agarwal, it says, sir, what are the three things you would want the government of India to do faster, better, or more focused? I think it's related to, it's an outflow of uh, the indicator that you gave that we have a different type of a government. So what are these three things? Over to you, Janpa. Thank you. Firstly, uh, I'm part of the government of India. So it's like telling myself what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> but... Uh, uh, one, of course, is uh, the strategy that I mentioned uh, that uh, contains, as I said, a large number of deliverables, which uh, are including, let's say, sharing of threat intelligence uh, that Glenn mentioned, uh, as well as creating structures uh, like the National Malware Repository. A large number of national level structures are part of that uh, strategy. So I would say, uh, approval of the national cybersecurity strategy uh, uh, should be should be a very important aspect. Second is I think uh, the, not only the government, the uh, corporates also from the CSR funds should spend a lot more uh, on uh, cybersecurity education awareness uh, because uh, you see now in our tier two and three cities also uh, these smartphones are uh, uh, spreading. Uh, whatever two G was there is now almost over. Uh, everywhere, at least the 4G is coming, and from 15th August, uh, the 5G is being launched. So a large number of our population, which is not very tech savvy, I'm talking about tier two, three cities, are going to have this device in their hands, uh, through which you know various crime uh, takes place. So and I get this report daily. I mean, uh, in our cybercrime.gov.in portal, there are 3,500 cases reported every day of people losing money. And uh, I mean, the actual figure is likely to be 10 times more uh, because half the guys don't even know this portal exists. So uh, for cybercrime, it's something like that, you know, polio campaign, you will remember that we ran some years back that we gave two drops of polio every Sunday or something like that. It has to be a massive campaign to educate people on, uh, uh, on improving their uh, cyber hygiene. And third, of course, is that a lot of indigenous uh, products have to come up. These are the three things. I think, uh, how do we support our startups in creating indigenous products? Because cyber 
is something that the moment uh, someone else start touching your data, uh, then what uh, Dr. Nishikant was also saying, uh, you do not know where that data is going. So we must uh, create our own data center also, that is one part of it, but uh, we must create our indigenous uh, solutions uh, for uh, the cybersecurity products. And there is a range of products, you know, starting from your HDR to the network security, to cloud security, to enterprise security, et cetera. So these are the three things I think which are the most important at the moment. Thank you. I think could, that... I, could, I, could I add on to that? Um, yeah, sure, uh, please. please. Go ahead. So, so the ones that I would add on to that, and I would, uh, as acting as the, um, uh, the Indian government, um, maybe I can uh, add some value for you. Um, one, I'd be looking at to address the talent pipeline. So uh, align with your, um, uh, you know, your discussion about having that uh, tier two and tier three cities that don't have the awareness um, we are, you know, really struggling with uh, professionals that can actually be sitting in organisations or be able to develop that awareness programs as well. Um, that would be one that I would be employing is that to challenge to look at the talent pipeline at the moment. Um, I'm uh, developing programs here within Australia to take what we call year 10 students through the journey of year 11 and 12 right through to university. What we're finding at the moment is that there, we don't have that that pipeline of people who want to be a doctor or a lawyer, I want them also to say, I want to be a cybersecurity professional and, and, and start those programs now. Um, the next one is the data breach reporting. So to really understand how big is the problem? You know, I don't think we can fully grasp how big is the ransomware problem is right now. So how do we capture all that data? And, and the, third, uh, the third one I would be saying is we need to, to make a concerted effort to track down the cyber criminals and the malicious actors now. Um, we need to start putting pressure on the financial entities and governments around the world to stop them operating. You know, when I mentioned when I was talking about the ransomware as a service, there's a loophole that they can operate because they're not actually, they're not actually ones who are deploying the ransomware. They're just developing a program that someone else uses. That's a loophole that we need to, to fix up. Um, and the last one is, and I think you, you did allude to this, is that cyber policy and the strategy. But I, I believe they should include foreign aid. So how do, how do governments work together? Um, the resources required, the cyber technology that you alluded to in terms of the innovative products that are coming through. And I'm gonna say it again, that threat sharing ability across the globe. Thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Murray. I think with those, uh... Uh, additional uh, points from your perspective. I think uh, Brigadier Sanjay Agarwal would be more than adequately satisfied uh, with his extensive uh, response, which is there. Now, the next question is from Mr. Sumit Kumar. Uh, Sorry, is, General Palwar. You, you Dr. Roja wanted to add a point. Yeah, yeah please, please. Yeah. I, want to, I just want to add to Mr. Singh that <clears throat> regarding the, uh, what should I say, regarding the strategy and the policies and everything which the government of India is moving forward. We should salute. There is nothing, there is no gap in that. The only problem is that there is awareness, but the only one thing which is lacking is that audit of that particular thing, the mechanism which is flowing. Now, if you talk about the awareness is going in the tier one, tier two, there is reporting or under reporting. What, what is the audit? How much effectively some certain kind of program is levied in particular area? So how much effectiveness it has come? It's just not but just throwing the money or just giving the grants or anything. A lot of verticals are already working. So uh, as Sir has told that uh, the policies are there, a lot of things are, but only we need to now synchronize and put them into an alignment. Then you see the result. Now what is happening? Everybody is working in an isolation. It's not here. It's basically everywhere. In all across the world, I have seen even in Russia, China and everything. But sooner or later, they synchronize. So what Sir has told that we need to have a centralized data center, which basically controls the inflow and outflow. That's about the data. And the second is basically the awareness program or what kind of uh, things are you going for, uh, means uh, making the people aware of those things. There should be a proper audit of those particular things. Then the things will get clear very soon. Uh, Jalpan, would you like to add something to that since uh, the coordination aspect has been talked about? Oh, it's okay. I mean, whatever you said is right. 
that uh, in our present system, uh, there are different ministries looking after uh, different aspects and uh, definitely there is a need to uh, improve the coordination. So uh, it's an important aspect, education and awareness. Thank you. Okay, so we move to the next question, which is uh, meant for Dr. Oja. It's to do with uh, data confidentiality. And in fact, Mr. Sumit Kumar has given this as relating the data sharing and data confidentiality aspect to the storing of black money in Switzerland. So he says something like, people say Switzerland is a soil of black money and cyber will become the next money, uh, money generator industry for countries in future. So why shouldn't countries join hands and share data uh, in, in connection with, you know, earn more money, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what the question is about. If you would like to give some sort of a response. Two things are there, very clear. What he has uh, raised uh, the query, it's one way. So what we have been taught in Sir, and you are all from the defense background, if you want to beat the criminal, you have to become a, like a criminal. You need to understand the psychology of the criminal. That this doesn't mean that you share the data, they will fetch your data and use the curtain, how much curtain you want to give it is in your hand. The data credentials needs to be evaluated and those data needs to be passed. Now, what we have seen the post COVID and everything, so a lot of money laundering was sir, has told that third fin, that the financial part was the, and even the Glenn has raised this particular question. The most of the money trafficking, the money laundering was through these kind of a small banks and cooperative banks, which happened. There was a must of the financial fraud, cyber attacks, then the other kind of uh, attacks, which is uh, working on the different critical infrastructures. It was on the financial. So when we are talking about uh, synergization with the European counterpart, and unless you have a synergization, you will not be able to, otherwise you will keep on working in isolation. That mechanism we have to design, like Sir told that we have got a strategic, uh, basically understanding how much access we have to give that is with us, where we have to cooperate that is with us. Like even you talk about the US, US doesn't share everything with you. So even he has categorized that when we are talking about the humanitarian, we are talking about A, B, C categories. We are not supposed to give you any kind of a data which basically should be floated from our side to your side. So that is that, there's nothing like that. Now, since the data is flowing from my country to that particular country, I can very well uh, monitor and safeguard within the soil of the country. So it's nothing that we should uh, let it go and then we should keep on asking them, please give me the data. So mechanism needs to be defined. And I think Sir has told the SOC is working security operation. Next generation smart SOC is there. So eventually, which is not able only to identify the threats, basically it will mitigate and neutralize the threat also here within the soil of the country. That's my nice. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Uja. Okay, we are uh, uh, reaching the, uh, there are just 10 minutes more left and then number of questions. So I'll, uh, there are two questions related to critical infrastructure. They are similar and both are addressed of course to General Pant. Uh, so I'll combine them. So first is from Rishi Atreya. And he says, what is the role of cybersecurity for nuclear establishments? And uh, the second one related to critical infrastructure is ARA metros. This is from Manoj Chanan, Deputy Colonel Manoj Chanan. ARA metros, railways, and air traffic control protected against cyber attacks. So, uh, would you like to take these on, General Pan? Yeah, thank you, Rishi, for uh, focusing on these two very important uh, aspects the nuclear establishment and the transportation, whether it is metro or the ATC. Now, as far as the nuclear establishments are concerned, uh, they have uh, both the IT network as well as the OT network. That, that is one part of it. Uh, in the IT network also, uh, it is split into an internet-facing network and their own captive network uh, within which their uh, establishments operate. So, cybersecurity for the uh, external facing network, which is internet connected, is very, very important. What we have also been saying is that there should be no link between the external facing IT network and their own intranet, that is one. And there should be also no link between their intranet 
and the OT network. So uh, this is uh, why in the cybersecurity is very important uh, in the establishments. And uh, uh, Glenn has already spoken about the OT network as to its importance. Uh, while IT networks life is just 10 to 15 years, uh, the OT machines, their life is about 30 years. So they are legacy systems. It's very difficult to implement some new solutions on them because it's all customized, uh, whether it is uh, PLC, SCADA, et cetera. So uh, this is as far as the nuclear and uh, even in power, this sort of the same concept can apply. As far as metros are concerned, uh, again, uh, uh, I can tell you in the Delhi Metro, uh, there is a, a command and control center uh, and uh, every uh, 50 meters along the track, uh, you will find a small pole uh, from where the, uh, the Wi-Fi sort of signals are being exchanged between the metro and from that, it is going on a, on a fiber link to the command and control system. So the moment you have a network, which is a IT, OT sort of network, cybersecurity, you cannot survive without cybersecurity. You have to protect it. And then protection of that, there are different concepts. You know, you can either go in for the enterprise concept of uh, cybersecurity, where you start with the firewall, you have IDS, you have IPS, you have your SIEM, SOAR, uh, et cetera. Or you can go in for different type of uh, solutions, uh, whether you want managed services, et cetera. So cybersecurity is everywhere. You mentioned nuclear and metro. Let me tell you, I want to ask anyone who says that uh, he is not a part of cyberspace. All of us as individuals uh, today are spending a couple of hours with this uh, gadget that we have uh, uh, in our homes, the mobile phone. Uh, the industry is dependent on that. The, uh, the new education policy is totally dependent uh, on uh, cyberspace. Governance is totally dependent on cyberspace. So uh, cyberspace is everywhere and cybersecurity has to be a part of our lives. Uh, my last words in all my lectures are that the uh, mantra to survive in today's digital world, there are only two mantras, personal hygiene and cyber hygiene. Thank you. And if I may just add just a very, just a couple of minutes on that. Uh, when I when I hear the word protection, um, I, I get I get a little bit worried um, because you know uh, you you can't. Uh, there's so many ways to attack uh, critical infrastructure. Protection is spread in my mind two different areas. What I call the proactive approach and the reactive approach. And the proactive approach is all about lowering the threat surface. It's about cyber awareness training. It's about understanding those you know the small things that we take for granted. If you go to a critical infrastructure site. And uh, from a, a occupational health and safety point of view, you won't get on that site without um, steel cap boots, a high vest, uh, colored vest. Uh, you'll have to wear goggles and a safety hat. You're told where to walk, what time, everything. They will really make sure that you are safe when you go on that site. But yet I can walk on there with a USB stick and nobody will stop me. Uh, the second, so that's, and that's also about understanding what are the vulnerabilities you have within those devices. But then you need to understand how many devices do you have? Where, is the, where are the devices located? And one of the problems that you'll find in a critical infrastructure environment, and because of all, and as you alluded to, the legacy systems, people don't know where they are now. And so as those, salts go, those sites go from those greenfield environments where they're, they're built in a pristine, everyone knew where things were, and then the brownfields environment starts going on top of them, it gets lost because these things aren't tracked from a maintenance point of view. And so what happens historically is that in a, a let's let's take a a, a, a water um, treatment plant. When a water treatment plant is originally developed, it goes through what's called a criticality analysis. Everything that goes on that site has got to go through this criticality analysis. But the criticality analysis will go: is it um, is it an operational priority? Is it an is it an environmental priority? Is it a safety priority? And that's when it'll go. If it lands on one of those, it'll get a maintenance program. That means it's tracked. So historically, things like PLCs and computers and skater equipment aren't deemed to be um, need need maintenance in that yes, in that structure. So therefore, what happens is that you um, they they're lost. Yeah, I think to one last question to, we can take for general permit or otherwise not to go on. To be able to do the vulnerability analysis, you've got to know where the devices are. And very quickly, the second half of that is the reactive approach. Once you've had a cyber attack. How do you detect and respond to it in a timely manner? Uh, right. 
since we are on the subject of critical infrastructure, in fact, I would like to uh, add a question to there. Uh, it's a related one. Uh, one is to General Pant and the other is to Mr. Murray. You mentioned, Mr. Murray, you just mentioned the proactive approach uh, to be adopted as, as against uh, there's a reactive portion and a proactive portion. And I'm sure you've uh, heard of this defend forward policy of the US persistent engagement, defend forward. So uh, what is what, what would you say on uh, such policies where you go beyond and try to you know look from, from where the threats are coming beyond your cyberspace? So that's one. And uh, to General Pansa, I would like to ask, is there a view on, since there's a critical infrastructure and the enormity of the cyber security of critical infrastructure is very important from a national security point of view, uh, what is the view on creation of some sort of firewalls, a common firewall which is defended by a common force for such critical infrastructure? Uh, maybe uh, Mr. Murray first. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I just want to reflect. So when, um, so I've always been in the electronic warfare, the information technology space, and my 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 wife is in the medical space, and uh, and so she she defend people's, you know, she saves people's lives, you know. And if you go back probably you know 20, 30 years ago, you know that was very prominent. Someone in the medical sector saved people's lives. Well, how it's starting to turn. People now who are in the computer you know, in the electronic sector are now saving people's lives. Point I'm making here is that the way that we're treating the data and where we're treating attacks is, is, is got to change. It's got to move away from that individual company thought process where company A or industry A is looking after it, the next industry looks after it, the next industry looks after it. We need to have a combined approach. Now, I know for a fact in, in New York City, they've started to, to change that and they have an operational center that is looking after all the critical infrastructure for New York City. So that takes into account looking at the electricity supply, the water supply, the ports, and so forth. And so what a cyber criminal really relies on, as I alluded to when I was talking originally, is that zero day attack. They spend a lot of money developing zero day attacks. It's not an easy thing to do. So if they have one, they wanna be able to use that time and time again. And so I put it to you, if you're living in a, in an area where you have electricity, water, um, a defense environment, how, do, how does the water utilities know that the energy has just been hit by the cyber attack? How does the energy sector know the gas pipeline just been done by the cyber attack? So yes, there is a lot of worth being able to defend forward and understand what's happening outside your organization and stop it before it gets inside your organization. But I believe that starts to look at a government you know, holistic approach now, where it's got to be a, you know, being able to, you know, lead this type of uh, approach. Uh, well, there are several more questions, uh, but since there were one or uh, a few more for General Pan, before you uh, tackle that, may I just add, uh, there's one from General Harbhajan Singh, uh, which says, are there any significant changes in the offing in the internet structure of league protocols, which will help in cyber security? Probably meaning the next generation internet. Uh, I think uh, we have just enough time for that because it's already 6.30. So I, uh, General Pant, if you could answer this, and I think we'll end there as a question second. Uh, thank you. And uh, General Arbhajan is there. Good evening, sir. Uh, as far as the uh, internet structure is concerned, it's a very valid point you've raised because the present structure is based on the 1970s design of the DARPA where the uh, uh, TCP IP protocol that is used is, is not based on security. The IP version 4 that is being used, uh, the, the packets could come from anywhere, go uh, anywhere, there is no checks, etc. So uh, the structure is changing. Uh, the IP version 6 is now coming out, which has uh, many more security features, as well as some countries have approached the uh, ITU for a new internet protocol. Uh, China is one of them. So uh, it's a very important point you've raised and uh, uh, things are in progress. But within the within the country, the earlier question that uh, uh, General uh, Anwar had asked on the firewalls, uh, you see firewalls are basically signature based. You know, it, it's like a sort of a, that you, all the IOCs that you are aware of, you put it there. If it sees it there, it blocks it, etc. It's very easy to bypass a firewall today. The sort of, you know, sophisticated attacks that are going on. 
So uh, while China has this golden shield, then uh, let me share with you now one of my projects from my R&D funds I have uh, also given to create a national firewall. But uh, the last thought I, that I can share is that there are three hard truths in the cyber domain. One, vulnerabilities will continue to exist. Two, if vulnerabilities exist, attacks will continue to take place. And three, the attribution of these attacks will be as difficult as what it is today. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for those answers. And with that, I think we come to the end of our time. So I hand over uh, the floor to Jan Murthy. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we've had a fascinating uh, webinar. Thank you all very much. But uh, before I actually propose my word of thanks, there is still one question that uh, I would like uh, Glenn and uh, General Pant and uh, Nishikant also to possibly uh, give a thought to or answer if you can in the next one minute or so. Given that crypto has lost more than 70% of its value in the last six months, that's more than $1.7 trillion. What is stopping the governments from legislating that private crypto is illegal? Take crypto away to prevent criminals' ability to move money around. I think this is hugely important for all countries. And I'm sure all countries would be interested in doing this. Can't we have a protocol on this, sir? General Pank, please. No, the RBI has again confirmed that crypto is not a legal tender in India. And there is no question about uh, taking it because of the lack of any regulation. All that we are going in for is the digital uh, uh, currency. Uh, the central bank digital currency is all we are going uh, for, and maybe the non fungible tokens. But uh, crypto, as far as RBI is concerned in India, it's not a legal tip. Thank you. Uh, I guess that uh, that answers it, but I wish there is a, or maybe we could, all countries could have, a, under the United Nations, could have a protocol to uh, ensure that crypto is declared illegal. I mean, not just India, but every country in the world. Uh, Thank you very much. With, with that, uh, thank you, General Pant, sir. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Dr. Nishikant Ora. Oja, sorry. Thank you, General Panwar. Uh, Mahadevan, thank you very much. Uh, Mahadevan is a core committee member of our CASA. And uh, from behind the scenes, thank you, uh, Ms. Barnali Shinga Roy. And I also thank all the participants for taking a valuable time out on a Sunday evening and uh, to be with us here. We look forward to your presence on 17 July at 5 p.m. Indian Standard Time for episode two of the series, Defending India's National Cyberspace, the governance architecture for which the registration link will be sent to all those who have attended this webinar and also to those who have not been able to attend it. Uh, without further ado, thank you all very much. A good day and Jai Hind. Yeah.